Hello and welcome to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast series. My name is Jonathan Brown. Shepherd Walwyn is a campaigning book publisher based in London, England. Our purpose is to uncover and promote new ideas to society's oldest problems. And whilst our specialty is ethical economics, something Anthony Werner, our driving force for over 40 years, has pioneered, we have branched out over the years to other related areas such as the environment and the lives and works of society's change agents. These podcasts promote ideas we're convinced can actually help us build a better society for all of us. So have a listen and be sure to share with your friends if you like them, but also tell us what you think. These are debates we all need to be part of. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. Welcome back to the Shepherd Walwyn podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Brown. We have a welcome return of Fred Harrison. Today, we're going to be talking about the corruption of economics and celebrating the, the launch of the ebook. Um, and also just taking a moment to celebrate the life of the late, great um, Mason Gaffney. Um, Fred, welcome to the podcast. Good to be with you, Jonathan. There's, there's a wonderful quote at the very beginning of the book by Hannah Aaron. I wonder if it's OK to, to read it. And she says, when everybody is swept away unthinkingly by what everybody else does and believes in, those who think are drawn out of hiding because their refusal to join is conspicuous and thereby becomes a kind of action. What was it in that quote that 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 prompted you and Mason to put that right at the front of the book? The philosophy that Mason and I and actually many others around the world advocate were was su- successfully suppressed through almost completely during the 20th century. Uh, and yet we knew that we had to persist with presenting what was the classical form of economics because it was correct. And so Hannah Arendt put her finger on it when uh, she referred to what she does in the quote that you read out, which is that uh, those of us who are on the margins in the wilderness, nonetheless, will one day be seen to be correct in our analysis of the problems of the world. And hopefully uh, the the social paradigm that we elucidate through our economic uh, perspectives will come to the fore to, well, dare I put it like this, save the world. Uh, The world does need saving. People probably we'll find out an acceptable way of putting it today, thanks to Mr. Putin and the way he's smashing up the peace of our world. Uh, But uh, in order to present a convincing case, we had to deconstruct the conventional, what is accepted as the conventional form of economics, the neoclassical form, to show that it's so seriously flawed that we have to sweep it away and start again, going back to classical economics. Hmm. And another, the book split into two parts, and Mason writes the first section on how economics came to be corrupted. What do you see are the main points in that part of the book? The essential point which Mason documents is this. The world was subjected to a conspiracy since the publication of Henry George's book in 1879, the conspiracy to suppress the understanding of classical economics, specifically land and rent. Now, when people say there was a conspiracy, they usually got no evidence for it, and they're trying to smear someone uh, without presenting a coherent case. But in this case, it really was a conspiracy to suppress classical concepts that are central to our understanding of how the economy and society works. And Mason documents this in forensic detail. He names the names of the mainly American professors who set about redefining words like land and rent so that their singular importance disappears and they uh, absorb these two words into alternative definitions so that people are no longer thinking about land and rent as distinctive and requiring uh, very specific policies in uh, governance. So Mason uh, documents it so thoroughly that, that we're no longer dealing with a 
conspiracy theory, but with a conspiracy that is empirically uh, supported by all the facts. And having uh, dealt with the disreputable way in which those uh, late 19th century economists and their universities uh, degraded the discipline of economics, we could now go on to elaborating a new model for the 20th century and now for the 21st century. So Mason did the clearing of the decks, as it were, before we started to reconstruct or rehabilitate the economic language through which policymakers, the politicians in government, could examine social problems and come up with coherent solutions. Yeah, and you know, and it is, it's an extraordinary story that he tells. And as you say, it's in absolute molecular, um, fully referenced detail. One of the things that, that I found amazing when I was reading both your introduction and, and Mason's part was that at the time, during the late 19th century, um, the so-called elites or the people in control were not afraid of Marxian thought. In fact, they actually praised it. It was, it was Henry George's ideas that were seen as dangerous. Yes, uh, the people who captured society were the landlords of the late uh, Middle Ages, the aristocracy. And once they'd got control first of the land and then the state through which they reformulated the laws of the land, they had to defend that uh, ground, that high ground, from which they were extracting the net income, the rent produced by the working population. They had to uh, employ every device to protect their vital interests. Any proposals for change that didn't disrupt their uh, special status, they accepted, they weren't worried. So Marxism was never a threat in the Western world. No one was going to go for it. That's why it was tried uh, on the uh, steps of Eastern Europe in Russia and then, of course, in China. What they, the, the elites really feared was the idea that we could scrap all taxes on wages and profits, which is an appealing idea, and fund uh, public services out of the rent of land, which is the net income that we all help to produce and is the, ultimately the only source of revenue from which a government can fund itself. The, the landlords who controlled the system were terrified of that uh, concept, which is why when Henry George launched his book, Progress and Poverty, they had to use every device to suppress it. And that's what happened. And that's what Mason successfully documents uh, in his contribution to the book. I know um, one of the things that, that people have loved about Mason's contribution to economics, which I would like us to get into, um, given his passing in, in, in 2020, was the way that Mason approached things in a very creative way. And I know he's written a book about creative solutions for economic problems. Um, and, and you edited a book called Rent and Masks, um, essays in honor of Mason, which were, again, creative ideas for, um, for economic problems. And, and he talks in the book about the way in which um, Henry George synthesized and reconciled seemingly disparate parts of the economic arguments um, and found a, a, a wonderful solution. Henry George was a journalist when he wrote the book out on the fringes of American society in San Francisco. He was inspired by his direct observations but also by acknowledging that the concept of rent as the public's revenue was not his idea. Uh, it was formulated most coherently by Adam Smith uh, and the subsequent classical writers who said uh, that the state, public services, ought to be funded out of rent. So Henry George took their classical writings and developed them uh, in the context of the mid 19th century. And Mason then 
built on uh, the classical concepts as a professor of economics in the uh, University of California. But not surprisingly, he was shoved into the backwaters of the university's framework in a town called Riverside. There was never going to be a chance of Mason getting a Nobel Prize for his writings or being invited to uh, teach in uh, San Francisco at Berkeley. He ensconced himself in Riverside, a relative backwater in California, and turned out the articles which showed that if we want coherence, if we want stability, if we want progress, this can only come about by acknowledging that the taxation of people's wages was disruptive and that the, the best way to fund public services was by directly collecting the revenue from the rent of land. So he did it from an academic point of view, uh, using the academic language, which meant that they couldn't reject what he was writing, but he, his articles never got into the mainstream journals because it was not the kind of material that the mainstream economists wanted to talk about or the politicians wanted to hear about. So credit to him, he kept working, kept delivering the goods uh, and helped people like myself, a non-academic, to uh, popularize his writings through our collaborations uh, in the hope that one day uh, sense would come to prevail. How long did you work with me? Well, I knew him before I went to Russia in 1992. Uh, in fact, going back to 1979 uh, at conferences um, organized by the Georgist Global Movement, uh, I got to know him and um, we struck up a uh, working relationship and I visited him on his hilltop home in California. He had a little orchard around this home of his, which was literally on the top of a hill. And in between writing articles on Henry George and his theories, he uh, pruned his uh, melon trees and uh, led a blissful life on that hilltop. And that's where I stayed with him on a number of occasions. Fantastic. Because you, you also you co-wrote Brexit's Blueprint in 2016, and then you edited um, Rent and Mast as well, which were essays in honour of Mason. Um, so it's clearly been important to you. Yes, he was a lifelong uh, friend and um, just a decent person who understood that his discipline had been sidelined seriously by the malevolence of the landlords who put up the money to persuade the professors in the late 19th century to pervert the course of justice. Mm. Do you know, I, I think in one of our conversations or in one of your books, you talk about deep lobbying um, as a concept and that you're the first person to talk about that um, that, I, that I came across. Um, and I know some of the tactics that Mason highlighted of what, I mean, it was actually, it was, it wasn't, didn't Rockefeller, wasn't he the main funder of the, um, well, of the attack on, on, on Georgist ideas? He was one of them. Uh, the, the, the uh, people who made the big bucks in America in the late 19th century were the railway magnets and uh, the bankers who created the, the universities with their uh, funds and which, which gave them a great influence over the teaching in those institutions. And likewise, uh, the la what were called the land grant universities, free land given to people who created universities across America, uh, those institutions use their free land to begin to accumulate profits out of land speculation within their locations. 
That's another story that I tell quite recently. So it was the culture in general, uh, driven by the landlords, not just in the UK, but uh, in America, who combined their common interest in grabbing the rents of land to uh, pervert the discipline of classical economics. And that's what we sought to bring out in the corruption of economics. Amazing. Amazing. The idea that, um, so and I, I know one of the things that comes up in the book and in your other work as well, is that if you want to win an argument, then you neutralize people who could go against you. So you win, you break, basically you offer bribes or inducements to people. So for example, the rents to bankers um, in the 16th century. And um, I think you said banker income was a measure of the amount of um, corruption. Is it in the in an economic system? Um, yeah. And then uh, and then the idea that you could set up a university, give someone free land, and allow them to sell it off for their own profits. Um, yeah, that would that would also help explain why that you know they'd be against ideas that would that would challenge that. Um, so, the consequence of of um, that history, that conspiracy, uh, if we can jump to the impact on today's world, the 21st century. Absolutely. Uh, goes something like this. What those guys, the, the renegade professors did was to say that land was no different to capital and rent was no different to profits. So we don't need to treat them as distinctive categories in economics for with distinctive policies that would shape the way government was administered or funded. So uh, that was their ploy. Uh, yes, we have concentrated during the 20th century uh, on explaining that that resulted in the loss of productivity in the economy, the loss of personal freedoms to decide how as individuals we want to live and the loss of efficiency in governance uh, by, for example, governments not having sufficient funds to, to pay for the services that people need. We explained all that in fine detail, but it wasn't sufficient. We, we relied on the reasoned argument prevailing among the general public, among politicians, among scholars, and I certainly came to the conclusion finally after decades of putting the case on a reasoned uh, basis that nobody was listening. They weren't interested in reasoned argument. Uh, and that was because our minds, our collective consciousness had been captured and shaped to accept the disgraceful way in which the commons were captured in the 16th century and onwards in Europe. We were conditioned to accept the malign consequences of what happened. But so what, what I've concluded is that it's not sufficient to just present the reasoned case for retrieving the classical way of presenting land and rent, because far more is at stake. In fact, it's the future of humanity itself, which is at stake. By perverting the concepts of rent, uh, I'll point out three consequences, for example. Society loses its resilience. That means it's not sustainable because we need the rent to invest in uh, the common good. Society loses its flexibility, the variability, the adaptability to new opportunities. And by privatizing rent, uh, there is a loss of what I call legacy assets. If we're not able to invest in those things like morality, spirituality, culture in general, because the resources that we need to fund those common uh, assets 
has been channeled away into the pockets of a, a small class, we lose complexity. And the losses of these uh, uh, attributes to society, the loss of sustainability, adaptability, complexity, means that we've dumbed down society to the point where we face an existential threat, the threat of extinction, because we lose the capacity to adjust, to defend, to overcome problems. The, the total uh, net income, the, the rents of land and natural resources have been so shifted to a small number of people who invest those resources in high price properties, in big yachts parked in the south of France and so on, uh, instead of being reinvested in the common good, that society cannot sustain itself, literally. And that is an existential problem, not just one of, oh, good governance and whether the tax regime uh, is hostile to efficiency and so on. We are now facing existential threats to the very future of our species because of what happened in the 19th century. So uh, needless to say, I'm now trying to enrich the debate that we Georgists uh, who campaigned on largely efficiency grounds in the 20th century to incorporate this uh, wider dimension, the threat to the existence of our species as a direct result of the corruption of economics. Unfortunately, uh, Mason Gaffney left us before I started expanding the narrative beyond the strictly economic discourse, because if he was still with us today, he would have contributed to this new dimension, to the case for restoring rents into the public domain and getting rid of the taxes that damage people's working uh, behavior and saving and investing in capital formation. Well, you know, and I, I think that's one of the, the, I mean, the master strokes of the opponents of Henry George. They actually, they've, they've been able to turn economics into the, the, the so-called dismal science and also make people believe that it has nothing to do with their daily lives or little, and it's only financial. Um, whereas actually the way that you describe that there is it's fundamental. How we structure our economic system is fundamental to how we structure society because certain interactions become impossible if we don't all capture the gain that we, we collectively are creating. Um, exactly. and, and we were talking um, as well, Fred, in, in a previous interview about your role in Russia. And right now the Russian oligarchs are being um, pilloried and chatted challenged and having assets frozen and um and so on and i just thought it would be it would be interesting because it it could be very easy to think that that what happened 130 100 years ago in america has got nothing to do with um with what we're what we're facing today and yet what you've just said there shows that it, it is relevant but also i just think a more recent example of that you saw of the corruption of russian economics that led to the creation of a system that created the oligarchs Exactly. And so what people like Mason and our other colleagues uh, and I tried to do in the uh, 1990s was to explain to the people of Russia that since the natural resources were already in the public domain because of the communist uh, history, they should keep those resources in the public domain, collecting the rents and therefore not uh, taxing the wages or the profits of the new private enterprises that would now come to the fore in Russia, and that that combination would produce a moral market economy that was, would have been unique in the world. They could have been a beacon of hope for humanity by the simple device of not privatizing the rents of the natural resources. That's the one and only thing they 
had to decide to do for the common good, keep those rents in the public domain, privatize enterprise, don't tax people's wages. That was the model that I spent 10 years uh, helping the Russians to understand, organizing seminars in the Duma, uh, talking on radio to the people, talking to the think tanks in St. Petersburg and so on. But all the time we were operating against the pressures from the governments in Brussels, in London, in Washington, who wanted those resources privatized. They used the Carnegie Foundation. They used uh, professors from the universities like Jeffrey Sachs to go and persuade Yeltsin that the best solution was to privatize the natural resources in what was called shock therapy, and they would then end up with a private uh, enterprise market. Well, those governments won and the Georgists lost. One consequence was that the rents which were privatized ended up in the pockets of a handful of people. So when Putin came to be nominated as the president of Russia by Yeltsin, all he had to do was call in those few people, lay down the law with them. They could keep their fortune in rents, providing they did as they were told and didn't interfere in politics. And that left him to dream about recreating Mother Russia on the scale of the Soviet Union. And the outcome was what we're seeing today in Ukraine, this terrible tragedy, which would not have happened if the Georgist paradigm, the sharing of the rents, the empowering of people and their private enterprises without being burdened with taxes. If that model had been put in place, they would not have ended up crushing babies in their hospitals and homes in the Ukraine. Mm. And you know, I think yeah, one of the things that I found demoralizing about the conflicts is when I looked into it, um, the Ukraine's got its own oligarchs. And, and one of the things that Zelensky was brought in to do, or he promised he would do, was to deal with the oligarchs, which all the evidence suggests that he hasn't sorted them out. And, and so absolutely, yes, you know, was, was Putin right to go into, into Ukraine? Absolutely not. And it's a he and this thing that he's done. Um, it's just that we've, just, we've still got the same economic system in both, in both worlds. Zelensky has been exposed in, um, I think it was the Pandora Papers, not the Panama Papers, but the Pandora Papers of having offshore trusts and and other things as well that's, that's somewhat problematic shall we say if he's supposed to be there to defeat the oligarchs um but we're all we're all subject to the same economic system aren't we well the ukraine was part of the soviet system when uh, it collapsed and they they ha- they faced the same issue of do they privatize or keep the rents in the public domain so uh, the West went around Poland, the East European countries that are now part members of the Soviet Union, the Ukraine and Russia, of course, telling them the same story. You must privatize the natural resources, which meant, of course, privatizing the rents. And the Ukraine was part of that system. The problem for, for Putin is that, uh, yes, they had oligarchs in the Ukraine, but they were the people themselves, who are not the oligarchs, were shifting towards the democratic form of politics. Mm. And Putin couldn't abide by that idea because it threatened his position in the Kremlin. So for one reason or another, he had to go in and smash up the country in the way that he has done. He has now got his way. He's won. Whatever ha- whatever the outcome now, uh, The Ukraine is no threat to his incumbency in the Kremlin. Uh, There is no operating society in uh, the Ukraine, and it will take a huge effort to reconstitute it, but it will only be part of the territory, and he will have claimed to have won. All of that history is because uh, back in the 1990s, 
the, the Western governments prevailed against the few people like Mason and myself and our colleagues who for 10 years kept on advocating this alternative model till one day I concluded in the year 2002, we had lost. Mm. And so I stopped. Fred, is there anything else we can say to people to, to encourage them to, to get hold of a copy of The Corruption of Economics, either in paper or digital form? Yes, uh, the concluding chapter was by Professor Chris Feder and myself about South Africa, which is another case study. And what is interesting about South Africa is that its constitution, after apartheid was uh, consigned to history, says the land of South Africa belongs to the people of South Africa. Here is a test case of uh, the constitutions, the rule of law that we all celebrate as if it's a, a perfect uh, system. The, the land of South Africa belongs to the people of South Africa, except that it doesn't. It belongs to those people who collect the rents of South Africa. And that means, again, a relatively small number of people. And we explain that uh, unless the rents are pooled by everybody who goes to work, who helps to create those rents, then those rents become uh, privatized, and that leads to corruption. And South Africa is one of the 21st century's disgraceful episodes in state capture, where a few individuals collecting the revenue uh, from natural resources uh, enables them to uh, coerce government, the South African government, into giving them privileged access to power and bribing the politicians. And that episode is before the courts now, but as a consequence, more people live in the shanty towns of South Africa than they did during the apartheid period. So when we talk about the land belongs to the people, uh, we need to think very carefully about exactly what that means because it's the rents, ultimately, that matter. Mm. Fred, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, talking to you. Um, you can buy the book, everybody, um, on the website and also at all good booksellers and, of course, at Amazon. Um, do check it out because it's um, as understanding how systems get corrupted. Um, Mason's work in the beginning of the book is just utterly staggering in its detail and its, its thoroughness. Um, and Fred's description of the George's paradigm is one of the clearest and the best that you're ever going to read. So, Fred, as always, thanks very much for being part of the podcast. You're welcome. And thank you very much indeed, Jonathan. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to the Shepherd Walwin podcast. To explore these ideas further, be sure to visit our website, www.shepherdwalwin.com and join our mailing list for news and special offers. Check out our authors and buy the books to learn more. And you can also find us on social media. Links are also on the website. And if you like the podcast, please head over to iTunes or Spotify to give us a review. It's surprisingly helpful in getting the ideas out there. So until next time, keep reading. <laughs>